that I would say launched the field of uh, socio-microbiology. So in this work, Steve demonstrated how complex cooperative microbial behaviors are vulnerable to cheating uh, by non-cooperative mutants, and then how these cooperative behaviors are, can be stabilized by non-random mixing and other mechanisms. And I'd say that Steve continues to lead this field of socio-microbiology and, it, and has really moved the field towards more clinically relevant contexts and, and you know, really identifying key challenges of treating chronic infections and antibiotic resistant infections. So in light of all this good stuff, Steve was awarded the Fleming Prize in 2010. That's the, the leading prizes from the UK Microbiology Society. Made a Colin Peck Scholar in 2020 here at Georgia Tech and in 2021 became an ASM Distinguished Lecturer. And so, I guess for the stats parts, right? That's to Marie. Uh, though, of course, you have to read the papers. Uh, Steve has eight, over 80 of them, nine from Georgia Tech. And this has been very impactful, has an H index of 51. Uh, since arriving in 2017 at Georgia Tech, uh, I think he's really decoded the, U the US funding system, which is weird, by the way, and uh, has racked up over 3 million in funding as a PI alone includes plants from the NIH, uh, R01, R56, and multiple from the CF Foundation. And um, I'll just, uh, you know, service, he's been on the council of the UK Microbiology Society, senior editor of the Journal of Microbiology, and as a, as a teacher, uh, lots of trainees have gone on to exciting things, including multiple PIs. And um, with that, I'm going to hand over to Steve, who's going to talk about Understanding interactions in microbial populations. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, thanks, uh, Sam. Um, the money's in the brown envelope in your uh, <laughs> in your pigeonhole. Okay. Well, thanks everybody, and thanks for turning out in person. It's great to see everyone, and thanks for everybody tuning in online. If there is anybody, hello out there. Uh, hello, Mum. Hopefully, who's supposed to be tuning in? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I turned up here in 2017, and I'd just like to say that it was a big transition for the family and for me. And overall, I've really—it's been great. Everybody's been fantastic. I've made to feel very welcome. I really feel part of Georgia Tech now. And, and America in general. So, you know, I bought myself a truck, so I think that kind of <laughs> highlights that. So anyway, so I'd like to tell you today about some of the work that we're kind of currently doing. I'm not really going to go over any sort of greatest hits tour or anything like that. I just want to talk about what the lab's doing right now. Uh, and so really broadly, we're interested in microbial interactions. That's kind of why I put this title. So some of the things we're working on, and I can't talk about everybody's work in the talk, so please don't hate me from the lab if I don't mention your work, because I'm trying to do a narrative in this. So understanding microbial So one of the things we're interested in is understanding our heterogeneity, so diversity in pseudomonas populations from cystic fibrosis lungs, impacts on antibiotic resistance. And we got a, a recent grant on this with Tim Reed at Emory to study this, and we're going to be looking at clinical isolates. We, we've been isolating a lot from Emory, and we're also going to be doing genomic approaches to try and understand what drives in vivo antibiotic resistance. So Jelly and Shader from my lab are working on this project. We're also working on our piacins. These are bacteriosins that Pseudomonas makes to kill other strains of Pseudomonas. We're interested in the regulation of those, how they impact the ecology of Pseudomonas infections, and can they be used as treatment? Madeline's working on this. We're also, Davino works at the CDC, and he's doing a part-time PhD with me. And so one of the things with Pseudomonas is there's a lot of high-risk clones uh, in the US and across the world that no one's really actually working with, which is really interesting. So Davina is going to be working with me. She's only really just getting into her project. She's going to be working with these. I'm going to tell you about this today. We're, we're working at how Pseudomonas forms multicellular aggregates. Uh, this is work led by Shader. We're collaborating with Joanna Goldberg at Emory. Um, we're also working on how phage killing dynamics and how spatial structure in populations alters phage killing. 
This is in collaboration. Well, Rob Edmiston is a joint PhD student with me and Jennifer Curtis uh, from physics, and Joshua is also involved in that. And finally, I'll mention this a little bit as well. We're working still on cooperation and conflict in quorum sensing populations. And Kathleen is leading that. Okay, so I want to start with a quote. So this quote came out in 1973 by a Nobel laureate, Francois Jacob, and he said, it's perfectly possible to imagine a boring universe without sex, hormones, nervous systems, and people only by individual cells reproducing ad infinitum. And, he, and then he said that this universe actually exists and it's a culture of bacteria. I only want to show that quote because we now know that uh, microbes have incredibly complex social lives and behaviors. So this has really been overturned. So we're really interested in infection. And why are we interested in infection? Well, this is just some numbers from 2009 from the CDC that healthcare associated infections alone cost 45 billion per year to the US. And these benefits of preventing could save us a huge amount of money. Even chronic wounds alone, like you can see here, sorry, it's before lunch, but like this is a chronic wound, affects a, a, a large number of people uh, in the US and the rise of type two diabetes is only exacerbating this, right? So this cause, these cause alone 200,000 deaths, 18 billion in direct healthcare costs. I mean, we tend to ignore these things with COVID, right? But these are a big problem. And also all the ventilator associated infections that we're getting from COVID, you know, these, these are a big problem. This was a report commissioned by the UK government. Tim O'Neill is an economist. And it was all about antimicrobial resistance and what the future is going to be. Uh, and Jim O'Neill predicted that by 2050, if we do nothing, we're going to have 10 million extra deaths per year, purely down to antimicrobial resistance. Huge cost to the global economy, and therefore we need new drugs and new antibiotics, which is a problem because there's not many in the new pipeline. There's not many antibiotics in the pipeline. So one thing we need to do is understand infection better because we don't, I still would argue we don't understand it that well. So this is the bug I work on, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. We classically call it an opportunistic pathogen because it doesn't tend to cause disease in healthy people. It's gram negative, but it can cause a wide spectrum of human infections if you're immunocompromised. Um, or if you have cystic fibrosis. It's the key cystic fibrosis pathogen. It will end up causing chronic wound decline, sorry, chronic lung decline over many, many years, and it will eventually kill uh, the patient. And you can't get rid of it. So it's hospital acquired as well. It's intrinsically antibiotic resistant, especially a lot of the clinical isolates we're working on. Uh, CDC, it's a serious threat pathogen. And luckily for us, it has a complex quorum sensing system that we can spend time on picking. And it's also very versatile. So it can switch from an acute lifestyle to a chronic lifestyle. So when it's in its acute form, it can cause severe infections in things like burn wounds. And it can be very, very rapid, cause a rapid bacteremia, and it can kill the patient within a matter of hours. And it does this by producing lots of cytotoxins and tissue damaging exoenzymes. Many are regulated by this quorum sensing system. But it can also switch. It can become chronic in cystic fibrosis, lungs, for example. In this case, it wants to form biofilms. So it wants to group together, coat itself in sticky sort of exopolysaccharide layers and, and sort of hunker down, if you like. And, and often it will lose things like quorum sensing in these environments. So it's very good at switching these lifestyles. So one of the challenges that they have in the cystic fibrosis field is this challenge of these multi-drug resistant strains of pseudomonas in, in, the, in the lungs. And we know that cystic fibrosis, obviously we all know it's a genetic disorder. You know, you get diagnosed very early. Uh, people are living a lot longer now. You may have only lived to your 18th birthday in the 70s, but now people are living into their 40s and 50s. So, so treatment has, has come on a huge amount. Um, and it's characterized by the sticky buildup of mucus in the lungs, the pancreas, and other organs. 
But in the lungs, this mucus clogs the airways, and bugs like Pseudomonas like to live in these mucus sort of environments. And they, they can evade the immune system. Over time, they cause damage. They recruit neutrophils in that also cause damage to the lung. So it's an overall chronic progressing infection that you can't really treat with antibiotics. Some of these patients have had kilograms of antibiotics in their life, literally kilograms. You can do the calculations and you still can't get rid of pseudomonas. So what are the challenges for, for us as researchers? Well, chronic infections, as I've just pointed out, they last a lifetime and they're term, you know, they end up being terminal. Antibiotic treatment ultimately is going to fail. There's a lack of appropriate models to study cystic fibrosis infection. The animal models are not very good. There are things like, like the sputum medium that Marvin Whiteley's lab developed, which sort of recapitulates the chemical and sort of physical environment of sputum, which is really helping um, us to study Pseudomonas in a more relevant environment. So that, that's a promising development. And also something we're interested in, that Pseudomonas populations in the lung, you usually get infected by a single clone and they diversify in the lung over time. So you get this very heterogeneous population where any one isolate that you pull out could be doing something different. That's a real challenge. Considering we always work with a lab strain that's clonal and we, we make a load of predictions uh, that this is going to be the case in the CF lung, pull a strain out of the CF lung and it's like doing your lottery number. So how do we approach that? I mean, that's a difficult problem. Does all the 40 years of research we've done on pseudomonas mean nothing when you start thinking like that? So I'm going to start by talking a little bit more about heterogeneity. So I've just mentioned populations of pseudomonas in the lung are heterogeneous. They're phenotypically and genotypically diverse. Here are three patients. Uh, different patients. This is a single sputum sample that from each patient at a single time point where we've picked, I don't know what there is, 20 colonies on each. Uh, they're all pseudomonas. If you genome sequence them, they're all the same strain. But you can just see by looking at them, they're very diverse. So this is a problem because what microbiologists or clinical labs tend to do, or us as microbiologists, is we'll pick one of these from a patient and then we'll work on it. And if we're thinking about antibiotic susceptibility testing, that's a big problem because you can pick this one here, you could pick this one here, and it may well give you a very different result. Some may be resistant, some may be susceptible. So you're giving the clinician maybe the wrong information. And this seems to sort of be consistently ignored in the literature as far as I'm concerned because I think it just means that you have to change practice, which is a very different, difficult thing to do. So this just is a very quick uh, graph to show you why that can be a problem. And this is data that Jelly has generated in the lab. She's had to like go through huge amounts of antibiotic susceptibility testing with lots of different isolates. And she's probably fed up with it by now. Oh, you're nodding. Of course you are. Uh, but anyway, antibiotic susceptibility tests do not always predict resistance. So in this case, we have three separate patients uh, and a sputum sample from each, where I think there's 75, each dot or whatever is, is a single isolate. So I think there's 75 per patient. And we test it against all these six antibiotics which are used in the CF clinic. And what you can see from this graph is if you take this patient here, then if you're above this line, you're sensitive to the antibiotic. If you're below it, you're resistant. And in this patient, the isolates cross that line. So if we pick this one here, we're going to pick a resistant strain. If we pick this one here, we're going to get a sensitive strain. Uh, in some patients, it doesn't seem to matter so much. Um, but I think the general point is should we be thinking about doing these tests differently? You know, should we be taking a sweep of colonies and then doing the test? Or should we be taking 100 or 70? I mean, what is the thing? That's one of the things we're trying to figure out. 
Uh, one of the aims of the R01 is to study this in more detail. Um, and the other, the other thing is that we, now we're going to generate hundreds of, of, of isolates of pseudomonas from CF. We're sequencing them all. I think we've sequenced 300 so far. And with Tim Reed at Emory, we're hopefully going to be able to do some bioinformatic pipelines to do some GWAS analysis to try and figure out which genes, because we're going to have the antibiotic phenotype, we're going to have the genomes, which genes are sort of responsible for in vivo resistance in these strains. That's the goal. We've not really got very far yet with the GWAS. So, so those, those are heritable differences. So if you grow that same isolate over and over again, you get the same Yeah, exactly. So it's not stochastic. They're genetically locked in. Yeah. So, so one of the things, so, so there's a whole thing going on with that, but I kind of want to move on to why. So what, what we wanted to do was, a few years ago, we wanted to just, as we were coming to Georgia Tech, was to generate a diverse population in a known strain, our lab strain PAO1. That's the lab strain everyone works with. And we wanted to generate a diverse population so we could study a number of things with it. We wanted to see what genomic changes happened in diverse populations. And one of the main questions was, how does that diversity that we generate impact on a community function, a population level function? Does that change? So we were interested, that was really the goal of this study. And this is kind of work that Shada did. And what she did was, she took um, our wild type PA01, our ancestor strain, and she grew it for 50 days in, in Marvin synthetic sputum medium, SCFM. This is a planktonic medium. It's not got any polymers in it. It's not got mucinin or anything. It's liquid. And she grew them on beads that we, that we looked at. That, that there's a bead assay that you can do biofilms on that Vaughan Cooper's lab pioneered in Pittsburgh. And what she did was that she grew PA01 in, in SCFM, the media, put in a bead and let the bugs grow on the bead for 24 hours. And they form really nice biofilms on these beads. They attach to them really well. And then she replaced, she put in another bead, let the bugs colonize that, and then just carried this on for 50 days. Um, and at every 10 days, we would take that population off a bead, and then we could sequence them, we could sequence isolates, we could sequence the whole population. We could do phenotype assays. So we had a 10, 20, 30, 40 and 50 days populations that have evolved. That's the basic setup. And what you can see is that pretty quickly, after 10, well, mainly after 30 days, you start to see some significant morphotypic changes in these colonies. These are just representatives that we picked out that we thought were distinct from the ancestor. Um, but you can see that by 50 days, you're getting quite a lot of different morphotypes. Now, the phenotypes vary even more within those morphotypes, but you get these varying morphotypes. So we were able to generate an in vitro um, diverse population that we knew had come from this ancestor. So when we started looking at, well, what happens if we look at the whole population phenotype? for each of these things. So this was done four times. There's four independent selection lines here, and we got pretty much the same result across it. It was very consistent. The evolution was very consistent. So these are two quorum sensing signals. You don't need to know about them yet, but they're two of the main ones in Pseudomonas. What we saw was after 30 days, the whole population was really decreasing in the amount of this particular signal that they were making. And this had an effect on protease, which is regulated by this signal. So you can see that after 30 days, the population as a whole is not making protease anymore. And this, this, this molecule was relatively unaffected. So that was a whole phenotype uh, assay. I think this is more interesting, though. This is antibiotics. So these are two beta-lactam antibiotics. And PA01 is sensitive to these two antibiotics. The ancestor is quite sensitive to them. But after 30 days, we were hitting a level of tolerance at the whole population level. So somehow, the bugs 
were becoming tolerant to these beta lactams as a population. And remember, there was no antibiotics added to this experiment, which I think is quite interesting. So diverse, so why is that? So we, we, we genome sequenced the populations after 10, 20, 30, and 40, and 50 days. This is just there for prettiness. You don't need to look at all the genes on it. The one that I really want to point out is this one here, LASR. Now, I'll mention LASR in a bit more in a, a while, but it's, the, it's one of the master regulators of the quorum sensing hierarchy in Pseudomonas. In PAO1, it sits at the top of the system. And after 30 days, you start to see a rise in frequency of LASR mutations in the populations. And this was across all the different selection lines that we did. And you can see the gene here. It sits, it sits above the whole system. So why might that matter? So we know that LASR mutes are commonly isolated from CF infections. They're very common mutation. Probably around about 50% of isolates you pull out of CF have a LASR mutation or a truncation in the gene. So we also know that LASR, because it controls quorum sensing, controls virulence factor production like toxins. So what happens to toxins when you get increased frequencies of LASR mutant in the population? Does the population level of toxins go down? We also know from the literature that LASR mutants also do give some tolerance to beta-lactam antibiotics. So just by doing some simple correlation analyses, that you can see that like the increasing frequency in LASR is correlated very nicely with these traits that are sort of decreasing uh, in the population. Um, for the protease, the signals, but also for the antibiotic resistant traits. So the thing is, all I really want people to take away from this paper is that diversity and heterogeneity in populations ultimately impacts on clinically relevant traits. So we now need to sort of expand that a little bit more into CF populations and really try and understand that in more detail. So that, this, this paper lead, led nicely on to the next story. So I can just jump into that fairly, fairly easily, actually, because now I want to ask, how does Pseudomonas form multicellular aggregates? So this is a very nice picture um, that... Rob Edmiston actually did, because he's adding phage to cultures. And when he was adding phage to cultures, he was looking and he was seeing that these planktonic cells suddenly turned into these stacking kind of phenotypes in the, in the, under the confocal microscope. And he was excited about this, but we said, well, yeah, we know what it is because we've kind of been working on these things. So I can, I can tell you a bit about this story that we just had published. So how it links into the last paper is that what Shada did is she was interested in how some of the 50-day isolates grew in biofilms. How did they form biofilms? That was her question. And so she just picked out different ones that had a different morphotype, and she grew them in Marvin's SCFM medium, but with added DNA and mucin polymers, the media that Marvin now calls SCFM2, because he's very inventive like that. He added two onto the end of it. So this is the second iteration of his media, and it now adds a bit of spatial structure to it because it becomes more viscous because you've got polymers in there. And, of course, eDNA and mucin are very important in sputum. So, so Shader wanted to know, well, how do these mutants grow in SCFM2 compared to the ancestor PAO1 that she'd kind of that she'd done the evolution experiment with. So when you grow these and the ancestor, what she found was two very distinct types of aggregate formation. See, I'm quite pleased I managed to get these rotating permanently. I didn't think I'd be able to do that. So uh, yeah, so on the left you see. Uh, a, a pattern that we, we call stacking aggregates, right? So this is where cells are sort of lined up, sort of not end to end, but they're sort of their surfaces are together, seemingly quite tightly packed. 
So you can see here that, and then they form these ladders and these networks, and it's really quite cool. And the other type of phenotype we saw was what we would call a clumping aggregate. The, the cells here seem to be a lot more random, the way that they join together. They would form these very large clumps, but also lots of little clumps. Uh, whereas this was much more of a, a giant kind of sort of structure, if you like. So they're the two things. So just remember the you know, stacked and clumped aggregates, because that's going to be a, a key part of this for the rest of the talk, I guess. Does anybody have any questions about that before we go on? No? OK, good. So actually, we kind of didn't know what this was, because it was quite weird. And we'd never seen it properly in the literature before. So to be absolutely honest, we were a bit, eh, maybe it's an artifact. So we, we shelved it for a little bit, uh, not quite know, knowing what to do with it, because it was really kind of bizarre. And then this paper came out in PNAS in 2018, late 2018, I think. And what they showed here, I looked at these pictures and went, it's a stack. Wow. They're not as good as our stacks, <laughs> but it is a stack. Uh, and, and this paper was all about how polymers pushed cells together by a force called, they call entropic deaggregation or entropic force. It's obviously a physical phenomenon that I probably don't know very much about, but that's kind of what it is. And so they were working with physicists on this paper. And the whole point of the paper was polymers such as is found in CS sputum, like mucin and eDNA, push pseudomonas cells together. And when they're together as like aggregates, they're more resistant to antibiotics. That was the whole premise of their paper. But the important thing was, they said, this is all physics. There's no biology involved here. You don't need biology for it. So we were going like, well, we were kind of, we were kind of worried about whether this was taking away some of our study that we were doing. But then I thought, no, it's a gift, right? So because if you go back, we realized by the, oh, now you see, now this is where it goes wrong. <laughs> I think you have to do it this way, because we knew that there were two different aggregate types. So it can't just be all physics. There has to be big ones, complemented it back with the SSG gene, and then it started stacking again. We're like, wow, it actually works. <laughs> it was very clear that like you could just do this. And I remember Shader calling me up to the compo room like, I can't believe it actually works. I'm going, well, there's some mechanism. And it does actually work. So, so SSG was important. Um, and we think it's involved in LPS. There's a couple of papers on that. So what about, so for those of you, so I had to actually revise about LPS. So for those of you who don't know about LPS, here's a quick summary. So lipopolysaccharide is found on the surface of some gram negatives, a lot of them. Um, and it kind of sticks out. And it's basically formed of three parts. You have, a, you have a, a lipid A portion, you have a core, and then you have the, the bands that stick out. And these are bands of sugars that stick out into the environment. And Pseudomonas has an A band here. And the A band is the same across every single Pseudomonas strain, aeroginosa strain. It's just a, it's just a combination of ramnose sugars. The B band is a variable band. It can have different sugars on it. And it's actually this that dictates the serotype of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And by that, people have been able to show that there are 20 distinct serotypes. So what we're looking at here is SSG is involved somewhere in the formation of the B band. So it doesn't make B bands, because we've done the LPS gels. So we don't know how it works exactly. It's probably somewhere in the core, but we don't know exactly. So what we did to confirm that is make some clean mutations in known LPS genes. So we knocked out the A band. And the A band still stacks. So it's not the A band that's responsible for switching from stacking to clumping. We knocked out a clean version of SSG in the ancestor strain. That goes to clumping. And these two genes, WBPM and WBPL, again, they're involved in B band biosynthesis, and they clump as well. 
So LPS is definitely involved in this switch from, um, from stacking to clumping. And I, <laughs> I did a three in the morning job at some point where you get involved in one of those deep dives into papers. I'm going, I really should be going to bed now. But I was trying to figure out what was it about the LPS. And then you can go back to some very early papers from the 90s that talked about LPS and hydrophobicity of the cell surface. And there was one paper in microbiology that showed that B band mutants had a more hydrophobic surface than the wild type. So that was the clue to me that I think this is what's happening. So shaded ran some hydrophobicity tests by putting cells down a column and seeing if they stuck or not. And what we can see is that PA1 wild type has a pretty hydrophilic cell surface, whereas all the B band mutants have a hydrophobic cell surface. And they, the A band mutant also has a hydrophilic surface mainly. Uh, and then clinical isolates vary. So we haven't really explored this much yet, but we, we're going to test whether they're LPS mutants and things. So B band mutants are interestingly often isolated from cystic fibrosis sputum. So maybe that small hydrophobic clumping is really important to them. That's kind of something we have to explore more in the future. So this, so our working model is really that the aggregate phenotype that you get involves both the concentration of polymers that can push cells together via entropic deaggregation, uh, such as the eDNA and mucin that we add to SCFM2, but also cell surface hydrophobicity. So the overall idea is that cell surface hydrophobicity is really important for aggregate type. And we need to figure out now why these aggregate types matter, right? Do they, does it matter which aggregate type they form? Okay. So the other thing that we're interested in doing is, well, now we have this cool model that we can make the cells do different things. We can either make them stack or we can make them clump. So what is the impact of this on social interactions? This kind of comes right back to some of the early work that I was involved in. So just to very briefly go over quorum sensing, I'm sure most of you know what it is, but it's the idea that at low cell densities, bacteria make a small amount of signal in the environment, and what they're able to do is sense the concentration of this signal, and as they get to high cell densities, there's lots more signal in the environment, and then the bacteria decide to make a decision. They become chorate, and then they all turn on quorum sensing de dependent genes at the same time. Uh, and so it's, it's a population level behavior. So it's all to do with signal concentration and then coordinated behaviors. And we know from many different bacteria, quorum sensing controls lots of different traits. Um, and there's now lots of quorum sensing signals chemically that have been described in the literature. Um, and in Pseudomonas, it controls lots of virulence determinants as well as motility and things like that. So this is a very basic diagram of what we know about the genetics. Aside, all I'm going to really say is, because I don't want to run too long, is that it has three main quorum sensing systems. It has a LAS system, a REL system, and a PQS system. And in PA01, our wild type, the LAS system regulates the REL system and the PQS system. That's really all you need to know about this. And they control between them a bunch of stuff. Maybe, maybe 10 to 15 percent of the genome is regulated by quorum sensing. So Sam mentioned earlier, I got involved a number of years ago now talking to evolutionary biologists because I was used to thinking like this, asking mechanism questions. Well, how does this work? Um, whereas they were much more interested in why questions. Well, why does it matter? <laughs> you know, why is it, what's its survival value to the, the bacteria? All these, and I'm like, and then, then it was really clear that there were some really basic questions to quorum sensing that were lacking the us molecular micro people weren't thinking about, you know, is it really signaling? Is it, a, is it actually a social behavior? What conditions lead to the maintenance or loss of it in natural populations? And at times, was like, I, I don't know. <laughs> well, that was kind of part of the collaboration that we got together, which was very interesting for me. 
And one of the one of the ideas that we got that we started to discuss more broadly was the idea of general cooperation in microbes. The idea that microbes make these common goods or public goods that are made by an individual cell, they're costly to make, they get secreted into the environment, and they can be taken up by any cell. So you can think of lots of things that are public goods in, in um, microbes. Uh, these are some examples. But we're really focused here on quorum sensing signals and the products that quorum sensing regulates. So the problem, of course, with cooperation is because it's costly, it's very exploitable by non-cooperating cheats that don't do the behavior and they spread in the population because they don't pay the fitness costs. So this is kind of early work that we did with quorum sensing. And what we developed was a medium that we call quorum sensing medium or QSM. And this is a minimal medium where we give it a carbon source that's a protein that if it doesn't make a quorum sensing dependent protease, the bugs grow very poorly in it. The wild type grows well, the bugs grow poorly. And by doing this, we were able to then mix populations of wild type, Lassar mutants, the quorum sensing mutant, which grew very badly in this medium and showed that it could socially exploit the wild type. So we showed the cheating stuff. So the reason I'm talking about that medium is because it's going to come up now. So one of the things that we did in this, it's all done in test tubes, planktonic cultures, very basic experiments actually. It's, it's more of a conceptual study. But we never really tackled spatial structure. So like, what, does, what, what happens if we spatially structure the populations? And can we do that with our quorum sensing medium? So Kathleen's been working on this. And this is kind of new, so it needs a lot of analysis. But I thought I'd finish with this, because I, I kind of think it's really quite interesting. So if you take quorum sensing medium and you add eDNA to it as a polymer, it becomes a bit more viscous. And the wild type pseudomonas will form stacks in it, like I showed you before. When you see these honeycomb structures, these are the stacks that are turned on their side, so you're just seeing the ends of the cells. And what initially Kathleen did was to take two versions of PAO1 wild type, label one with GFP, label one with M cherry, and just see, grow them separately, and then mix them in this medium with DNA in, and say, well, well what happens? And what happens is that they just form stacks between them all. So you get this nice kind of patterning, like a Christmas tree sort of decoration. So we knew that in quorum sensing medium then, that the structure was probably being formed by this entropic deaggregation because of the polymers pushing them together. So that was kind of a nice start, because we didn't even know if they would grow in this. And then, I like this figure because I think it shows quite a lot. So if you take PAO1 wild type, which is green, and it stacks, as you can see, and then an O-antigen mutant, a B-band mutant, and then mix them together, they don't really interact. You get clumps of O-antigen mutant, and you get stacks of green wild type, which shows you that like, just by altering the surface, there's a potential of like, altering whether the bugs are going to socially interact or not. And I think that's quite interesting. Again, there's lots more work needs doing on this. We've got to do a lot of quantitation. I'm looking at Kathleen, she's like, going, yes, I know. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, but it's a cool result. And so the next question we asked was, well, we know the wild type grows well in this medium, but does the Lassar mutant grow well in it? And the answer is it doesn't grow very well. Um, theoretically, it should be able to form stacks because it's got a hydrophilic surface. But it doesn't grow to the densities in this medium that allows it to form stacks. So it grows poorly compared to the wild type. So in a very basic first mixed experiment, what happens when we mix the Lassar mutant with the wild type? And what you can see is that they start inserting into stacks. And they survive quite well. And they start to sort of exploit and start to do quite well. So they're tightly, they've got the same surface, so they stick together hydrophilically in stacks. And, you know, I don't know, or we don't know whether 
I mean, some of these things that we can start studying is how important is self-proximity for cheating and things like that. But this is very early. This is, I'm just showing you really early data at the moment. Well, this is kind of a cool result because it shows us that lattar mutants can insert into these stacks and maybe socially exploit the wild type. But what happens if we put them with a clumping strain? So in this case, we've taken an O-antigen mutant, which is green. This has a hydrophobic surface, so it clumps. The lattar mutant has a hydrophilic surface, and it just can't join in with it at all. And in fact, it just grows very, very poorly. You can see the odd, where it's very close to a clump. You can see the odd lassar cell here. But in general, it gets wiped out. Whereas in the other system, it doesn't, because it's able to join in. So this is the important point that I think we're going to be working on in the next paper, which is that cell surface properties actually are able to dictate who socially interacts with who. Uh, and I think that that will be an exciting kind of way forward for some of the social evolution studies in the field. So we're working on it. It's going to take a bit of time to, to really analyze this properly. So in the interest of keeping to time, I'll summarize what I've said. So one of the first things is that as microbiologists and as clinical microbiologists, we tend to pick single colonies and ignore population level effects. I think this is something I think it needs to change, but I don't know how we change that because it's convenient to work with a clonal isolate that you know what it does. Evolving populations, when you do an evolution experiment, and when you get a more heterogeneous population, show changes in community or population level phenotypes. Again, does this matter? Does it matter in infection? We don't know. So I think that there's a lot more to explore there. Pseudomonas forms different aggregate types in polymer-rich environments, and this is determined by the cell properties, and we have a mechanism for that now. So how can we exploit this? I mean, there's an obvious one to do with the cheating stuff. That's one angle. Um, but because they impact on social interactions between cells, what does this imply for future microbiome studies? I mean, if you or, or some of the bacteriosis and stuff that Madeline's working on, if you have a pseudomonas strain that can kill another pseudomonas strain and they get forced together in a stack, you're left with one species, or one isolate, right? But if one of them alters its LPS, they can coexist, so you have two. So it's a very primitive way just by changing the surface of having, building up the amount of variation in there. And maybe that's the same with other organisms that have LPS on their surface. So, I mean, Brian did a quick test of cholera, and that stacks really nicely in, in, in a, a polymer medium. Can you force these bugs together? I mean, if you have a microbiome where one species dominates over another, if you force them together, you're going to get one species. But if one has an altered LPS, you're going to get two. So I think that, it, I think it does have implications for future microbiome work. And so that's something that we kind of like to think about a little bit more in the future. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for coming, everybody online, uh, and my lab. So Shada, Madeline, Kathleen, Jelly, Davina, Rob, and Jacob's now left. But Jacob was really instrumental in making mutants for us and things like that. He's, he's now doing, uh, so he's, he's gone to retrain uh, and so but he was very important and collaborators at the moment Joanna is collaborating she's at Emory she's collaborating with us on LPS she's like a, a, an LPS expert Tim Reed we got the R01 with he's at Emory he's a genomics uh, microbiologist Jennifer in physics and Joshua and then Sam Marvin Brian um, Brian and Peter we've got a grant on together with an, with an NSF grant looking at bacteriosins and how strains kill each other. Uh, and then Sam and Marvin have been involved in various aspects along the way. So with that, thank you very much. Uh, I think we're at time. I'll take some questions.
Okay. All right. Okay. So I want. Oh, yep. Yeah. Go ahead, Greg. So, so Steve, I have a, a thought on the second half of the talk, and then a question on the first half. Um, so, so the thought is, well, I guess it's a question here, but the stacking and the clumping. So, so what, 30 years ago, when I postdoc, a colleague of mine, I think it was Kolobak, that did this experiment where he saw a signaling between cells. When he centrifuged the cells, they didn't signal. When he got them to a line like this, the really clever sandpaper thing that got them to roll, they signaled because they were lined up. Contact dependent sort of thing. Yeah. So, so, so is there a difference in the clumping and, and the stacking well, in terms of how much? Because it looked like the stack ones really are on top of each other. The, yeah, the they are. Doing, no, they are. They're, they're, they're lined up like this. Oh, sorry. Yes. The, the, the question is, is does the... Um, are the cells really lined up, right? Is that and 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 can you actually distinguish between whether they're going to signal more or less depending on the or the the confirmation? Well, I think that that's one of the key things we want to look at actually, because I mean one of the one of the ideas would be that I, one of our ideas is that like when you stack, because your cell proximity is very tight and you're very closely aligned. Does that allow you to quorum sense or signal more easily between cells? And you kind of can think of this idea of maybe a telephone network as it goes along because the, the, you kind of see that like network of cells. And maybe when they clump, because they can, when they clump, they can be end to end, they can be like this, they can, and, and it really then depends on like whether how far the signal is diffusing, right, in these viscous environments. If it's not getting very far, maybe you do have to be very close to signal. But no one's really shown that because everybody just does it in planktonic well mixed cultures. So I think there's an opportunity to test whether the aggregate type actually does change how quorum sensing. So one of, one of the things, and I know Sam's worked on this, so we know that there's a heterogeneity in a quorum sensing response, right? So in a planktonic culture, some cells turn it on, some don't. Um, and our very early videos of stacks seem to show that they all turn it on at the same time. So it's some tentative evidence that maybe that removes that stochastic QS response. I don't know if that kind of answers your question. Uh, well, the question was actually to do with Jelly's kit. So, so um, you had this nice 50 day evolution, and so you see you accumulate mutations. Um, in a patient, is that the same time scale? So if you were to take, take a, a, a two years and then look at two and a half years, is that long enough time or is it artificial? So I would say, so the question is, is does the heterogeneity that we saw in the in vitro evolution experiment over 50 days, is that the same sort of time scale you'd see in a CF patient, right? So I would say we don't know, but I would also say I think probably I don't think it would happen as quickly in the CF lung. I mean, we've certainly got populate. I mean, it's very hard as well to get the samples of like somebody who's recently been infected with Pseudomonas. So one thing we do have, if anybody's interested, is we, we've collected over the last two or three years whole populations of Pseudomonas from different patients under different treatments, under different you know, temp, we've got um, ones over time, we've got different treatments, we've got ones undergoing an exacerbation versus when they've been treated. And we've collected the whole pseudomonas that we can get. And so we've got 50 populations stored now, if that's of any use to anyone, because usually people just pick a single colony and store it. So, um, but in terms of the diversity question, I think it probably takes longer than 50 days, I would say. But I, I don't actually know the answer to that, because it's hard to get the samples. I'm sort of following up on this. In that early on slide that you showed where you'd isolated, I think, 75, it, there was great variance. Um, and what, the phenotype you were measuring was antibiotic resistance, right? Yeah, let me so find the slide. Some of those patients uh, had a very variable population. Some of them had. And is there an effect? Is do the more as an ecologist, if I'm looking at oral or fields or something, those more variable ones 
are going to grow as a clustered population a lot faster, more diverse species together. All I well, I don't know about whether they cluster or they grow. All I can tell you is that I, what I didn't show you is that Jelly has also done the phenotypes of growth for all of these isolates, and I'm some of when you grow them together. Well, we don't know that. That's a good question. Okay, do they come out of patients? Are those more diverse patients ones that are in more trouble, or ones that are harder to treat? In the less so, so again, that's something we're trying to answer and it's hard. So there's a couple of points I would make on that. Is that firstly, when we get a sputum sample, we just get a plate and it's full of colonies and sputum. And we have no idea whether any of those isolates were found next to each other. So you could cough up on a plate, something could come from your throat, something could come from the deep lung, something from the mid lung. So, so whether these isolates, they're all the same strain, they're all the same, you know, you sequence them, they're all the same. But whether they've ever interacted, I don't know, right? And the other thing was about um, growing them together. And no, actually the patient. So one of the things we're interested in is does the heterogeneity matter for whether the patient is sicker or not? Because no one really knows why people in, I mean, it's still, it's the biggest clinical problem a CF patient has is an exacerbation. And no one knows what causes it. So we know that they're chronically colonized by pseudomonas from a very young age. And we know that if you take a patient who's been on an exacerbation, or if they're treated, they have the same pseudomonas load. People know that. But people don't know anything about what the pseudomonas is doing. But there's also a possibility, people have talked about maybe they get a viral infection, or maybe it's another bug that blooms and then goes away. We don't know any, everyone has their explanations. Our, we want to figure out with, if you have a more genomically diverse or less div diverse pseudomonas population, can we correlate that to patient health? And we've, we've kind of, we are, Shader's is working on that at the moment. We've, we've kind of got some, which way around was it, Shader? Uh, the more uh, genetic diversity, they have worse lung function. And well, yeah. we have some data on how many other species of bacteria are there, that that's kind of like negatively correlated. So if you have more diverse pseudomonas population, you have less standard diversity for other and yeah. less lung function. So that's something that... It's Maybe that's something we should talk about more from a more ecology standpoint, I think, because I think there's a lot to unpick there. There's just so much data and stuff, it's hard to unpick it. Um, I guess, I don't know how you would do it, just thinking off the top of my head. Um, because there's so many different SNPs as well that you get in these populations that, that it may not just be that, there may be multifactorial ones that are important together. So it's a really difficult one to try and unpick that, I think. But I mean, it's something that, the nice thing about that biofilm bead assay is that you can just, you can take a 50 day evolved population and then you can say, right, well now we're going to take that population, now we're going to add antibiotics to it and run it for another 50 days and then see what happens. Or we're going to add immune cells to it or we're going to add another species to it. So we, we thought about that, like, but it's a lot of work and, you know, it's really hard to come out with a very clear question and, and know what you're going to get. I mean, this, this took a while to figure out a paper story from that, but it was, it was one of my crazy Friday afternoon experiences, like, let's just evolve this for 50 days and let's just see what happens, and then you, you start on picking it. So, but yeah, it, I mean, you, you could definitely do different evolutionary pressures on them and see what happens. Hey, I think we're pushing up against the end. Final yes. questions? Oh, we can, yes. It's not my mum, is it? Because this will be the worst one. <laughs> be the hardest to answer. So the question is, to you is, is it possible that the diversity of the cultures emerge not from random effects, but from the positioning within the lung, whether it's in the albinoli? 
I, I think that's almost certain. It kind of goes to what I was saying before. We don't know where any of these um, colonies have come from. So I would imagine that if you have one that's very slow growing, for example, one of the interesting findings is that the real slow growers, like really bad growers, they take two days to come up on a plate at least, often have the highest antibiotic resistance. And I think we miss them in the clinic. In fact, I'm sure we do. So I'm pretty sure they're giving the wrong information back quite a lot of times. Uh, so that's something that we, we need to you know, put into our next paper and make a point of. If they're found in different areas of the lung, all of these colonies have come from different parts, it's almost certain they're all under different kind of selection pressures. So, but we, it's hard, how do we figure that out easily? But I, I definitely think that's one of the reasons we get this heterogeneous population. It's not necessarily that these, these isolates are interacting with each other at all. They're just kind of, maybe they're clonal in that environment. I mean, I don't know. We'd have to get, that, we'd have to get whole lungs, explanted lungs, and pick out areas of the lung and then do heterogeneity tests. The problem with that is that when you get an explanted lung, they're often really damaged and it's just a soup really about stuff. So it's really hard to, to um, pull apart anything meaningful from that. Okay, well, we're at the hour. So, thanks, Steve, again for a fantastic Thank you. Thank you.